Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jessica Roscoe. I'm the SVP of Sales for Platform SH. With me today, I have John and Paul, both from University of Missouri. Uh, today, we are going to talk about cats, <laughs> but in a different context. Uh, we're going to talk about their migration to the cloud from on-prem uh, to a more, more DevOps world. Um, and as you can see from our session, it's a lot like herding cats. So. Uh, Paul and John, I guess I'll give you guys a chance to introduce yourselves and talk a little bit about what you do at the university. Uh, my name is John Boyer. Um, I'm a back-end CMS architect at the University of Missouri. My name is Paul Gilzo. I'm a developer relations engineer with Platform SH now. Uh, but just the three short weeks ago, I was a programmer analyst and the WordPress lead for the University of Missouri. So in terms of the presentation today, whenever I say we or us, I'm referring to my time at the university. Good clarification point. All right. So let's uh, just talk about Platform SH for a second. Uh, so Platform SH is a service uh, that was built for developers by developers. And really, the, the benefit or value that it brings is that it helps with faster deployment workflows. It automates a lot of repetitive time-consuming tasks for developers. It reduces a lot of development bottlenecks, supports different tech stacks, uh, and it's built with security in mind with 24-7 global support. Um, so I think that we can start. Uh, it's always good to understand some of the context and the background on some of the challenges that University of Missouri was having and why did you go down the path of moving to the cloud? Yeah, I think many of the people watching can understand that the University of Missouri, like many of you probably, uh, in terms of the web, were decentralized. And by decentralized, I mean that anybody with the budget uh, could purchase their own web servers, could hire third party hosting. Heck, they could even take an old computer and stick it under a desk and, and host a website there. There really were no standards. In fact, we had a, an administrator join the university in the early 2000s and ask how many websites does the university support? Nobody could answer. We had no idea. We had to guess between 1,800 and 2,000 uh, from go, uh, from domain searching and Google searches, but we really had no idea. Um, and, and in addition, with those no standards, was that anybody could create a website. Uh, we had undergrads creating websites and administrative assistants creating websites, um, and everybody creating that same wheel, working in little silos and being inefficient. Um, to kind of give you a visual idea of that 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 lack of standards. This is a, an image of all the mastheads of many of our most popular websites back before we began this transition into standardization, just kind of visualize how dissimilar things were. Now, I joined the Central Web team in 2007 and the Central team supported the Chancellor and the Provost. Um, and the Chancellor came to us at that time and said, um, I want you to begin to create standards for the campus and begin to take those standards out to campus. Um, at, but unfortunately, he didn't give us any authority to enforce the standards. So it was a lot like this, where we'd go out and we'd talk to people and, we, and we'd start to convince them of the benefits of standards and doing things the same way. But no sooner did we get everybody kind of moving in a, in a general direction than a dean or director would say, you know, I don't like that standard. We're going to go off and do our own thing. So in it, that's just really difficult to support, right? And so by the time... John and I really began this process of, of migrating and creating these standards. We had 25 years of unstructured, unorganized digital sprawl, which is really, really hard to support. In fact, as we began this transition, we took an inventory, discovered, you know, we were using 13 different CMSs on campus. From an institutional standpoint, how do you support that much diversity? About the same time back in 2007, the central IT division did decide to go ahead and offer centralized web hosting and in an effort to reduce the number of servers on campus. And this was fantastic. This really took a step forward in beginning to standardize our web infrastructure. But unfortunately, there were conflicts immediately, almost immediately, between the central IT, the developers and administration, because the organization of the central IT division is that they have teams for everything and they're kind of siloed. So you got a team for accounts, a team for the DB, a team for server administration, a team for Apache, et cetera. And an administration would want sites up quickly. They'd come to the developers and say, we want a site by the end of the week. Well, because of all the teams and the siloed nature, it could take a week to two weeks between when you put in a request for a site to when you could actually log in and do anything. And that caused friction. 
Uh, there was some friction between the developers and IT because as developers, we'd want to keep components of that stack up to date. And they were reluctant to update things that didn't ship with the OS. In addition, administration would come and they'd say, you know, we got this new campaign. We want to add four buttons to every website on the entire campus. And they had this idea that all the developers were working in this perfect synchronicity, right? That we were all exactly the same when really it was every man for himself, you know, every silo developer just trying to get their job done. And then my poor department in the background, just trying to push people in the right direction, the same direction. So in 2015, the central IT division came to marketing communications and said, you know, our goals for systems administration is no longer in alignment with your needs and requirements for web hosting. We're going to delegate the web hosting service and that responsibility to your division. Well, you know, we didn't have the skill set to, to support web infrastructure. We certainly didn't have the resources to go and, and purchase or hire sysadmins. So we knew we were going to need a vendor. Um, but we definitely had an idea of where we wanted to be. We knew we needed more standards. We knew we could no longer afford dissimilarity in infrastructure and setup. So those 13 CMSs, we decided on Drupal and WordPress. But even inside of WordPress, you know that there's a dozen different ways that you can configure WordPress. So we knew we needed to standardize inside of each CMS. Um, we also knew we needed to move farther with standards into the app layer. Um, Authentication is a good example. We had developers who did local accounts. Some would tap into LDAP to do a single sign-on experience. Some integrated directly with Shibboleth. So we knew we needed standards all the way down. We knew we needed to be faster. Uh, we needed to be able to respond to administration faster and roll out sites more quickly. Uh, we also knew we needed to keep the components in the stack updated more quickly so that we could stay up to date with the rest of the world. Uh, we also knew we needed some flexibility though. Uh, we knew that there were going to be sites that weren't going to be able to update, that, that were abandoned and didn't have support, that might not be able to upgrade their com particular component. Um, and we knew that we needed uh, that ability to move into different stacks. You know, with WordPress and Drupal, we were heavily invested in PHP and MySQL, but we had Python apps, we had Ruby apps, and we didn't necessarily want to have to go back out to RFP just to get another vendor to support those stacks. The other piece in the flexibility is, you know, higher ed's we not weird, but unique, right? We have a lot of unique requirements, unique situations, and most vendors want you to bend your workflows to their systems. So we knew we needed a vendor that was flexible enough to allow us to build up the workflows that we needed and support those. We definitely needed to be more efficient. We weren't going to get any more resources, so we knew we were going to have to do more with less. Um, so we needed to increase those efficiencies with what we had, as well as increase or increase the efficiency and collaboration between developers so that developers could support each other uh, more efficiently. And we knew we needed performance and uptime. Um, our performance wasn't bad. Uh, you know, we were load balanced and we could perform pretty well, but we knew we had sites that knew that needed increased performance above others. Um, and we also needed better uptime because while we had a development system on campus, there was no tooling, no automation to sync production down into development. So we found a lot of developers were doing coding directly on production and updating directly on production and taking business critical sites down. Um, in addition, because of the fragmented nature of the central IT in that previous hosting, the backups were in different locations. So your DB backup was over here, your file backup was over here, uh, you know, your Apache and PHP, the system backup was over here and trying to restore a botched deploy could take hours to days. And we knew that was no longer acceptable. Yeah. And, and that's exactly what, what I see time and time again, as I talk to customers uh, that, you know, there's the technical challenges of you know, making this kind of change and shift to cloud, but a big part of the, probably the biggest challenge is the cultural one. So how did you guys go about in approaching that? Well, you know, we had a team that we thought was pretty good and we had a lot of experience doing this. So we kind of knew what we would run into. But of course, like with every project like this, you run into things that you don't expect. Uh, you know, the first thing that we realized that we needed was better DevOps practices. You know, and the best way that I can describe that really kind of echoing back to what Paul said is that we had no really defined way of how code would get to production. And we really didn't have a defined way of what the dependencies of a project even were, which made a lot of this uh, this whole process um, difficult 
in that we had to go back and define um, to use any modern service um, what what our apps were and and you know all the processes that had to occur for them to be deployed to production. So um, along with kind of those workflows, you know, um, we had to decide on you know what what source control system to use. Um, a lot of us were using Git, um, but we were using it in different ways. Um, we needed to have tooling around Git to uh, make sure that when uh, websites were pushed to production, caches were cleared, things like that. And we need to make sure um, with some of those definitions uh, that you know the, the environments were consistent across development, production, and then the local environment so we could really move as quickly as we needed to move. So, um, So uh, we also had to had to had to communicate uh, with other groups on campus. You know, I think any anyone that goes to a service like this, um, we knew that uh, you know platform.sh would um, provide a lot of the services, but there were still going to be some things that we would have to go out and either uh, purchase or use uh, locally because other groups on campus already had contracts. So for instance, um, on campus, we use uh, an, a local GitLab instance. So we had to go out and make the connections with IT to go get things set up the way we wanted to get set up there. Um, we had to make accounts locally, uh, or, or not locally, but in our, on our campus network. So we had to go um, meet with, with uh, the people in charge of accounts and, and deal with the policies surrounding that. Um, and then, you know, with all that stuff, we had to kind of turn this into a service. Um, you know, we needed a code base to give out to developers. You know, we didn't want a developer who was coming into our process to have to uh, re-research, you know, everything that, uh, that, that we'd already um, investigated for any hosting service. By bundling some of this stuff up into individual libraries and packages, we were hoping to um, make reusable bits of code that uh, would make just onboarding developers much quicker. So, you know, with any of these services, you know, our devs, uh, we tried a number of services before to, before settling on Platform SH. And, uh, you know, we, we always share this, this uh, graphic of AWS. Um, you know, our devs could get this set up uh, working on a WordPress or a Drupal site you know, in an afternoon. But um, we found out pretty quickly that refining this to scale and actually deploying it as a service for our campus was going to be quite difficult. Um, yes. You know, AWS and Azure and, and, and Google Cloud and all those services are really cool. But if you start digging into this graphic, there's a lot of little pieces that most of, most of our developers, myself included, don't have really extensive experience on. You know, we don't have a CDN expert. Uh, local and, and at our university that I know of. Um, so as we started trying to figure out how we could automatically bring this stuff up, um, we determined that we had to go with a, a service that kind of solved some of those problems with for us. So that's why we landed on a platform SH. So um, so with with that, uh, if we can go to the next slide. Um, um, after we chose the service, um, we had to, as we talked about earlier, had to connect some of the, the microservices, but then we also had to really dig into the policies, um, mm -hmm. uh, surrounding a lot of the microservices and even, you know, the hosting service in this case, platform.sh itself, you know, um, we determined pretty early on that we needed to use SendGrid to send out emails from uh, our, our web applications. Um, based on our internal policies, can we use SendGrid? Well, we have to ask the security people. Mm -hmm. um, if we use a CDN like Fastly that came with uh, some of our larger platform plans, um, can we send traffic through that? <laughs> you know, So there's all these services that we just had that we hadn't really used as much, or if we used something similar, it was an on-campus service, so we had to figure out, uh, you know, all, all the policies that applied to that, and 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 if we could actually use those services and get the clearances, and figure out how we could use them while staying within um, uh, uh, the, the campus security policies. 
So um, after we got uh, through that, we um, we started getting into actually building out the service, and then we had some goal changes. Um, you know, Paul mentioned single sign-on. Uh, that took a lot longer than expected, yes. just because universities uh, use something called shibboleth a lot of times, uh, which is an implementation of SAML. And, uh, you know, there wasn't a lot of documentation at the time um, of how to get that to work with the service. Luckily, now I think there's more um, after working with us, there's more uh, documentation on the platform SH website about doing that. But that was something that took us longer to figure out how to um, register these services automatically with the on campus uh, group that handled single sign on. Um, our CMS strategy changed. You know, at first, you know, Paul mentioned that we knew we wanted to get to WordPress and Drupal, um, but at first we, did, we we thought we were going to move everything to WordPress and Drupal. Um, pretty quickly, it became apparent that um, we we had a third option, which was to make static sites for certain sites that weren't touched often. And um, so we kind of did a little bit of a shift there in that we decided that um, certain things that didn't need like the CMS experience or were updated every couple of years could be moved to static sites and, 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 and we could save some um, complex, complexity with those. Um, we also ran into, you know, things that were apps that weren't even mm -hmm. CMSs. So what do you do with those? Um, you know, platform could probably host them, but um, from an interpersonal or, or, or business relationship of the university, were those really were we really the best people to be handling those? Um, in some cases, yes. In some cases, we needed to figure out who could who who would actually handle those apps. Um, our security model, as we mentioned a little bit, had to change quite a bit. Um, there was a lot of internal policies that we have to navigate around as far as accounts, you know, what where traffic could flow and things like that. And it just took a lot of meetings with a lot of different people to figure out. How can the university best, you know, safeguard um, accounts, secrets, things like that? But it took a lot of time to get through that. Um, something that wasn't obvious at all, I think <laughs> none of us, not none of us, thought about was the domains and then the Apache technical debt. Um, using a classic LAMP server, um, people were able to add a pretty much unlimited amount of domains to their project, and a lot of the logic managing that was in the server config. So um, when we go back to talking about how um, we needed to make sure that the dependencies of a project were defined, since those were actually outside of the code base, um, once a site would go live, you'd have to figure out from a client, oh, why isn't this domain po pointing to the correct site? Well, because that didn't actually live in the app. So we have to go back and figure out how, you know, how to get all those things um, accounted for and assigned to the correct uh, service. Um, or to the correct, correct application. Um, traditional op operations services, um, you know, there were certain things that, uh, that, that happened with our on-premise hosting that also happened on platform um, as far as like backups. But um, historically, when uh, Campus was, host was uh, taking our backups, you know, their group had to determine what the internal policy was for keeping them or mm -hmm. how often... <laughs> you know, uh, they were going to be taken or when they were going to be deleted. So, you know, although Platform could provide us with a tool to say, hey, we can script how to back up the websites, we had to have the meetings to go through, you know, what is our policy for all of these services that maybe we didn't actually have to think about as much or, or someone else in the organization thought about. Um, with WordPress multi-site, those of you that have used multi-site know that, uh, it is very heavily tied to the domain that's in use. So when you're talking about using a service that can bring up one-to-one -one clones of your production site for you to develop on, and it gives it those ephemeral URLs, suddenly the site doesn't work and it requires going in and, and updating the database and updating those domains. And, and so building a system that was efficient and gave the developers a smooth experience in having to work in these multi-sites, both in a development environment and locally, uh, was simply a hurdle that we hadn't anticipated. We also hadn't anticipated the number of multi-sites we had. We didn't know we had so many. Uh, in the, in the uh, former model, the formal hosting model, uh, the pricing strategy was such that many people discovered they could save money by hosting every site in a multi-site uh, and, and choosing it for that reason instead of strategic reasons. 
Uh, caching was another one we hadn't anticipated. Uh, we got lucky with Drupal because caching is built into core. But those of you that use WordPress know that caching is almost required uh, to install. And it's all through a plugin. And there's hundreds of caching plugins. In fact, if you can think of one, it was in use on campus. So I had to go back again and think and begin to develop a strategy for how do we support caching across all our sites and improve that performance for all the sites going forward long term. Um, yeah, so I mean, I'm sure everybody that's listening to the session that has a thousand or thousands of websites out there um, is probably thinking, yeah, sounds great, but it's such a daunting task. So yes. how were you guys able to approach it and and why was it worth it? Oh, so uh, the, we broke it out into phases. Uh, that first phase we just talked about, the exploration, the discovery phase, where we really got our, our minds around uh, and an inventory of all the things we had to deal with. Um, and that's when John and I began to to formulate our strategies of how can we manage this fleet of sites long term and not just one or two, but, you know, a big fleet. Um, and as we began to migrate some of our own sites, we started to reach out to developers uh, that we had relationships with and ask them to come in and join us and begin to test out some of these strategies. Uh, one of the first strategies John and I came up with was this concept of an upstream. And an upstream is, is the scaffolding. It's a canonical root repository that contains directory structures, configuration files, and some scripting for the builds. And then every project, every site is forked or built off of this upstream. And we maintain those relationships in GitLab. And this allows the downstream project developer to look back upstream and see if there's been any changes made and incorporate those changes back into their project and allows us at the upstream to look downstream to see if anybody hasn't pulled in those changes. The other piece that we knew we would have to do, um, partially because it works best in platform, is this concept of dependency management. And for those of you that don't use depend dependency management or aren't sure of it, um, it's the idea of defining all of the packages and libraries that your project, or in our case, a site, requires in order to function. And not just that, but you also define all the versions of those packages that are being used so that you can confidently rebuild the site and know that all of the code is exactly the same that you have in production. Now in PHP, the de facto dependency manager is Composer. And again, with Drupal, we got lucky because at Drupal 8, Composer support is built in. But again, with WordPress, as many of you know, WordPress is not built for Composer. It's not built to be used with Composer. And so we had many iterations with those initial developers of just trying to figure out the most efficient way to use WordPress with Composer and having to go back and reiterate on that multiple times. Um, we discovered then with those developers that we had a bit of a skill set gap um, between what they currently could do and what we needed them to be able to do to be efficient in this system. And that's no shade on them at all. Uh, many of them, were again in silos, team of one, working in, and had years of experience working in a traditional LAMP stack, you know, where all they had to deal with was Apache and MySQL. And suddenly we're throwing this entirely different infrastructure at them where they've got a router application where they're gonna have to worry about. And then all of a sudden their application is read only. And then we've got somewhere else that's different where they can write files and then a database is in a different location. And it just, it took some time to get them over the hurdle and get them to wrap their heads around that. Um, I think John mentioned Git earlier. Uh, we discovered that Git adoption on campus wasn't nearly as widespread as we initially thought. Uh, so we brought in Git classes, got people trained up on Git, and then quickly discovered that Git in the classroom is completely different than Git in the world. Uh, you know, Git is extremely powerful, but it doesn't impose a workflow on you. It lets you choose the workflow that works best for you. But if you take a bunch of people new to Git and then a bunch of people that have used Git and develop their own workflows, and then you throw them all together and you try to get them to work, it's chaos. So again, John and I had to stop and we said, okay, well, now we've got to come up with a Git workflow um, and came up with something we thought was fairly simple. But again, trying to get all of those developers uh, to get that into their that, to that muscle memory of using this workflow that they weren't used to using. Uh, for our core uh, WordPress developers, again, this whole concept of dependency management and composer workflow was pretty challenging. Uh, they were used to going into, as I mentioned earlier, going into production and updating the site. And now we're saying, you can't do that. In order to update a site, you're going to have to 
clone the repository, create a branch, do your updates, push that up, create a merge request, let all these things happen, and then per and then merge it into and push it out to production. Um, and we also found a lot of the developers had never used the CLI or the terminal. We found some that were adverse to it, that just did not like it, um, and, and began to express this feeling of an overload of CLI tools because we had you know, Git, we had Composer, we had Platform CLI tool, we had Lando, WP CLI, Drush, all these, and just a general sense of an increased workload. I had a developer come to me very frustrated and say, look, you know, this feels like you're asking me to go from zero to 100 overnight, and I've got a site that works. You're asking me to do all this work just to get a site that works. I don't understand. I said, John and I, again, we had to figure out how do we, how do we convey the message that yes, we're going to front load a bunch of work and it's going to be a little painful, but we're going to gain so much efficiency down the road and begin to try to get them to understand that we're looking at this from the institution viewpoint and not a siloed single site. So it really highlighted to John and I that we had to do a better job of onboarding the developers and building out more developer resources. So we got some sites that we owned, you know, that we had control over. We got those migrated over. We iterated on the developer onboarding and we were ready to move into the beta phase. That beta phase is where we opened it up to any developer on campus and said, come join us. We've got this awesome new tool, come use it. And the benefit for you is you get one-on-one -on -one support and you get one-on-one -on -one training with us right away. We quickly found out that local development, like all the rest, was not standardized. People had WAMP and MAMP, no local development. So we standardized on Lando. Um, and Lando allows us to mimic almost one-to-one -one the environment the platform gives us, but locally. Unfortunately, we discovered that many developers were using hardware that's five to seven years old. And Lando's pretty hardware intensive because it's bringing up all these virtualized environments. So we had to come up with some hardware standards. You know, one of the issues that we came up to, what, with that was the hardest moving from a LAMP stack uh, to platform or, or you know, a more, um, a more modern cloud-based uh, stack is that uh, there was database workflow challenges. You know, in, in the old paradigm, you have a, a server that sits there and uh, the database just stays constant. Um, in this, in this uh, the, the new workflow, um, you want to bring up environments that are identical to that you want to clone it locally you want to do all these things and uh in addition you want to you know we were hoping that we could um allow more developers to work together on the same project and not be and not be um you know uh, silos of one developer and because of that um with with cms development as anyone knows um who's who's gotten into like the the the, the cloud-based development or the group development with the CMS, you have to be very careful about about moving the database around from one um, from from one environment to the next, and you can't necessarily push database uh, the database at production without losing uh, losing your content or data. So that was a really hard um, lesson for a lot of developers to learn because we couldn't get people to stop pushing uh, the database to production. So, you know, we did some training about that and, and figured out some workflows to, to, to help to uh, help us with that. But that was a big issue. Um, and then additionally, um, as we started making these sites live and getting to these like other sites that were kind of in in uh, more um, uh, areas that were further away from the central web hosting area, we found a, a, a myriad of, of DNS issues based on the fact that our DNS names uh, originated from the 80s, and a lot of the network topology uh, decisions were made before the World Wide Web existed. So definitely when going on a project like this, um, we've finally gotten over the hump, but if, if you're at a university and you do something like this, definitely make sure that um, you've talked with your networking team about uh, how or if you could move certain domain names to point at the cloud and how you'd go about that. All right, so uh, I know we're coming up uh, to the time here, but can you guys just kind of give us a, a glimpse of where you are today and kind of where do you want to go from here? So we've moved, I think, every knock on wood um, CMS site that was centrally hosted, uh, which is great. Um, we've also moved to getting some um, sites that maybe we didn't know existed when we first started this project or some of the more odd sites. 
and we've been you know reaching out and grabbing those ones that were hosted by vendors. Um, we think the workflow is stable. Um, most developers can get their work done um, after coming into the after coming into our system and working in it for a while. They're, they're, you know, for the most part, they're productive, and we can get ourselves out of most problems that we get ourselves into. Um, we have middleware that helps script um, some of the management of these tools and really makes everyone's life life easier. And in general, we just have substantially better WordPress and Drupal performance. And I would also add security onto that as well. Absolutely. Um, you know, um, everything's faster, and we have uh, knock on wood again less security problems. Um, so the other thing that we've done is we've uh, standardized on local development uh, setups, which makes it much easier to get developers started. We know when they start what kind of computer they're going to have, what kind of local environment they're going to be running, and they can get started quickly. Um, we have a testing framework set up uh, where we do behavioral, visual regression, and different types of, uh, of, of tests on our sites to uh, help ensure that uh, projects are built correctly. Um, and then uh, we have automated CMS and plugin yeah. updates. So yeah, one of the one of the challenges of moving to this type of system is that read-only app environment. Um, so again, you can't go into WordPress and click the update button. Instead, you have to do the whole workflow process, and that takes more time. Um, and we were seeing some issues in that time increasing as we added more and more sites. It's not a big deal. At 20 sites, you get 200 sites, and suddenly that becomes an issue. But because of the robust API the platform provides and the GitLab service that we have on campus, we've been able to fully automate the update process. So we have a CLI tool that we built that, again, clones the site, creates a branch, does the update, pushes a merge request. The merge request builds an environment on platform that then runs all the automated testing. And all the developer has to do in the end is go through and make sure that there's green check marks on all the jobs do a final manual visual inspection, and then can confidently merge that into production and push it out. Um, so we've saved hundreds of hours, again, because of that flexibility. Uh, WordPress multi-site support is stable. We've got full support for subdirectory multi-site, subdomain multi-site, and multi-domain multi-site, all within that upstream update, or that upstream framework. So, we're always working on you know more automated testing you know we we can all there's always more stuff that we can test that's what we're currently working on now in general auditing you know we always want to make sure that our modules themes libraries are up to date and everything's secure and that we have a, you know a, a a grasp on the sites that we host and then we're also working on you know uh De decoupling some of our architecture both progressively and and completely like headless cms installs and uh you know uh breaking up different components into javascript frameworks that would traditionally be on the cms so we've learned a number of lessons through the process um as far as testing goes um you can have as many cool tools as you want as many cool programming languages and frameworks but you still have to have the time with this many sites to sit down with your individual customers and work through what the site actually needs to do. So no matter how good you are as a developer, knowing you have to do some legwork to find out that someone's site is actually working the way it's supposed to, to define that so that you can automate all of the stuff and, uh, and give everyone a better experience. Um, with our automation, you know, automation is almost always the way to go, but we have found out that as you automate more stuff, you do move your developers further away from knowing how some of the nuts and bolts work, um, which that doesn't mean that we wouldn't automate stuff in the future, but you have to make some time um, to, I think, have developers work with some of the backend tools yeah. at a little more deep level, because when you run into, you know, um, issues that maybe you don't have you haven't run into before the developers still need to know how some of the back-end tools work so they can fix those edge cases and sometimes a lot of automation means that people forget how some of those back-end tools work um, we're also a little bit by by using a service which this is not a bad thing but a change from uh, on-premise hosting is that you're beholden to uh, the provider's schedule and timeline so in the past where we could say, 
um, with our internal services, um, if, if, if a, a deadline was coming up, we could hold patches indefinitely and we could do a number of things to make sure things didn't, uh, you know, didn't have to get changed on the environment. Um, platform gives us a lot of flexibility on holding back on uh, versions of PHP and other libraries, but we still aren't necessarily in control of their maintenance window. So just making sure that we're up to date on when the host is doing maintenance helps us out which also means uh, going along with that fact also means that we have to keep up to date with the API of our host, which would be true of any host. Um, when you build some of these integrations and automations around it, um, the host is gonna continually um, you know, add features, potentially deprecate features. So it's not like you can build the automation or the tools yeah, around it and just you know, be finished um, in some ways that you could potentially do a little bit more on a LAMP stack you have to keep you have to keep uh, your integrations up to date and make sure that they're still working. All right, so let's remind the audience as we close out here. Uh, what were your goals in mind when you started with Platform SH, and uh, how how did Platform SH help you? So remember, we wanted we wanted more standards. We wanted to be faster. Uh, we wanted a lot of flexibility in what we could do. We needed to be more efficient, and we needed to increase that performance and that uptime. Uh, so specifically how Platform helped us. Uh, Platform is like Git in that it doesn't enforce standards on you, really beyond the use of Git and, and, and the build process. But it does give you the ability to build standards around it um, and use it as a carrot with your developers. In addition, we are much faster. Um, now to, uh, to get a site to a developer to begin building out something, the longest piece is our own internal accounts team. Once we get that new account created, it's between two and five minutes when we can give that site to a developer and they can begin building a new site. And we're much faster in responding to feature requests, um, as, as well as being able to update components in that stack. As I mentioned earlier, we were able to update PHP from one version to another in a day or less. Uh, we definitely have more flexibility. Again, if we, we have found sites that broke when we updated PHP, we simply, didn't, we simply left them where we were, but they didn't hold back the rest of the fleet. Um, platform has definitely supported our workflows. So we were able to build out the workflow that best works for our fleet and platform supported that workflow instead of us having to mend and bend around theirs. In addition, as John mentioned, they're beginning to move out into decoupled. We don't have to go out to an RFP to get another vendor. It's already there. We have that flexibility to move into those other stacks. We are far more efficient than we ever thought we'd be. We have more sites than we started with when we started this process. We have fewer developers than we started this process, and yet we're able to still support the entire fleet. In addition, collaboration between those developers is much more efficient. Almost every dev now can step into a project they've never touched before and at least begin the troubleshooting steps to figure out what's wrong. Because those standards in place, we've increased that efficiency. Our performance has gone up drastically. Um, if we need a development environment, we can spin it up quickly to do debugging. Um, we are able now to deploy to production confidently that it's not going to introduce a regression into production. Um, our WordPress performance, we didn't mention this earlier, but it, it increased 350% across the board in addition to that caching performance. And we have consistent backups. We now know where our backups are. They're in one place. And we've had situations where deploys did go bad, but we were able to roll back that site to a known good state in minutes, not hours or days. And if I'm being truthful, and I hope everybody accepts this with my full honesty, Platform revolutionized the way we managed our infrastructure and our fleet of sites. And I hope John agrees with me on that. Yeah. <laughs> So we hope that this has been both beneficial and informative and at least mildly entertaining with the cat gifts. Um, we hope we have some time left for questions. Yeah, if we don't, or even if we do, please feel free to reach out. I know I would love to talk to you about either fleet management or platform or WordPress, and I'm sure John and Jessica as well. So thank you very much. Thank you.